director. And I was learning to become a dive master. And part of the dive master training was the dive rescue part. And that's when I first learned about CPR and, and artificial respirations. And my psychologist said, Daniel, you should maybe use your hobby of doing artwork through photography to help process and purge these emotions and feelings you're having. I thought that's a horrible idea. And when I shared it, that's when I realized that other people will look at that image and attach their own experiences to it. Most superhero origin stories, they're all stories of post-traumatic growth. You're like the Hulk that's been exposed to gamma radiation, and now you have this super ability because of that trauma you've experienced. Welcome to Respond to Resilience, along with my co-hosts, Dr. Stacey Raymond and Bonnie Rumali, LCSW, EMT. I'm David Dashinger. On this episode, we'll be speaking with Daniel Sundahl of Dan's Son Photo Art about art, trauma, and post-traumatic growth. We invite you to like and subscribe. Our YouTube channel is Respond to Resilience. We're on Facebook, Respond to Wellness Inc., and Responder TV. Catch us on bbsradio.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and visit our website, respondertv.com, for past episodes and guest information. We'll be right back to speak with Daniel after this. In this family, more of us die by our own hands than by the hazards of the job. In this family, up to a quarter of 911 dispatchers have symptoms of PTSD. In this family, our mental health and wellness are in crisis while responders are quietly suffering. In this family, many struggle with job-related stress, burnout, trauma, sleep disruption, substance abuse, and marriage problems. In this family, we can help the helpers with vital information and resources, resilient strategies, and success stories of overcoming the obstacles. In this family, no one is alone. Welcome to Respond to Resilience with co-hosts, retired Lieutenant David Dashinger, Dr. Stacy Raymond, and Bonnie Rumley, LCSW, EMTB. Today we're joined by Daniel Sundahl. He's a published artist and writer and has three art books produced of his works. Articles of Daniel's work are featured in several international publications, and his art is recognized worldwide as he travels internationally speaking about his art and personal experiences with occupational stress injuries and post-traumatic growth. He's an advanced care paramedic, pre-hospital educator, a retired firefighter, photographer, and photo editor. Daniel, warm welcome to Respond to Resilience. Thanks, David. It's great to be here. It's nice to see you again, Dan. Thank yeah, you. you too, Bonnie. Yeah, thanks. I'm excited about our conversation today. It's going to be good. Too. And Stacy, I think this is your first time meeting Dan, right? So My first time great. meeting him, but um, I know him through um, Greg Shovak, who's a paramedic oh, okay. in Hartford. He lent me one of your books, and I was so thrilled uh, by the pictures i have a lot of questions for you so okay <laughs> all right i'm a little bit nervous well, stacy <laughs> don't be, don't be. No, I, I read your book and i got questions for you That's, uh, well, never a doctor has questions it's bad news <laughs> yeah no that's great no i'm, I'm excited to talk about it. i love talking about my artwork and and mental health and it's, it's i'm very passionate about it great well let's talk about how you became a firefighter and a paramedic and how that's been for you Okay, well, it's, God, it's a weird story. I was living in the Cayman Islands. This is the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, learning to become a dive master. And part of the dive master training was the medical rescue, the dive rescue part. And that's when I first learned about CPR and uh, rescuing, you know, CPR and, mm -hmm. and artificial respirations and wound control and that kind of stuff from a perspective of taking somebody out of the water. And I got really, I really liked it. I was really passionate about it. I was like, oh, this stuff is really, really interesting. And on my way home, I saw this guy get hit by this massive, big, huge dump truck, like right in front of me. Wow. And I got so excited. I'm like, yes. <laughs> you know, a weird response. So I pulled over and I'm like, oh, I'm going to help this guy. And I went up to him and he was like folded in half and his foot was up by his face. And, oh, and I'm wow. like, I have no idea what to do. I have like, I don't know what to do. But I was so excited thinking that, okay, well, I just learned how to pull somebody somebody out of the water. It's mm. totally not relative to what I just saw, but mm -hmm. I was still really excited to do that. And I thought, wow, that's kind of a weird 
<laughs> there's something wrong with me. Maybe I should be a paramedic. <laughs> so that's, that's when, when I first, you know. <laughs> that's when I knew that I was, I was, uh, I was off kilter enough that I think I'd probably be a pretty good paramedic. And uh, that's when it first came into my head. And then uh, I continued to travel. And when I, in my God, early third, early thirties, is when I ended up coming back home to Canada and uh, became an advanced care paramedic and firefighter. And I was full time for 20 years. So that's kind of how I got the idea in my head first to do that. And right. it certainly didn't disappoint. It's been a very exciting career, that's for sure. <laughs> I've seen accidents like that just as like driving by and that's how I know I could never be a paramedic. That's or, right. Or an EMT, you know? Like it's just, it's it was, it's too much for me. Can you tell us, Dan, how did you start creating your artwork? What inspired you to begin creating that? Uh, well, I was diagnosed with PTSD in 2014. Mm -hmm. And at the time, all my artwork is photo-based. I was taking pictures of my dogs and landscapes. So it was kind of mm -hmm. just a hobby. Right. And throughout my <clears throat> therapy, my psychologist or my therapist said, Daniel, you should maybe use your, your hobby of doing artwork through photography to help process and purge, you know, these emotions and feelings you're having. And I thought that's a horrible idea. I'm like, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to get into it. I'm like, I came here, give me a pill so I could be okay. And then I'll go back to work. And he's like, Dan, that's not how it works. It doesn't really work <laughs> that way. Um, and I'm like, Oh, goes, trust me. So <clears throat> the very first pictures that I did were, you know, and he was right. So I stage it. Because I have all the Rolodex of all these calls yeah. and these emotions that right. from mm. a long career that most of us have. And I stage it and I photograph it. Then I digitally draw and paint on top of that photograph more of how I feel versus what I saw. So I'm really process. And now that I'm learning the stuff mm -hmm. I'm learning in school about using my frontal cortex while I'm interrupting mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. then, you know, I can understand that it works, you know, and mm -hmm. it, it Right. So it takes about a week to create one. Hmm. And during that time, I really process and purge these things out of my head. And then I trap them into this two dimensional picture. So when I'm finished, I'm able to mm -hmm. have that memory, but there's not an associated emotional response to it. And so the first ones I started doing is in 2014, but it was part of my therapy. therapy so, so I, I never had planned to create it for other people. people. I, I never, never intended, intended to share it with them. people. Mm -hmm. In fact, the first ones that I did, um, and I can really can't see them. I have the original in the back here, but it's this paramedic, and he's in the back of the ambulance. There's a body underneath the sheet. He has his gloved hands on his head. There's the spirit of the patients in the airway seat. And, you know, I looked at that. I'm like, I'm not going to share this with anybody. Like, my fellow paramedics and firefighters will look at this. Yeah. And, what are you doing? Like, why? A, he's got gloves on his hands. That's disgusting he's being vulnerable and he's being upset and that doesn't happen with emergency workers we're infallible heroes mm -hmm. so i never planned to share it with anybody expecting that i would get a lot of negative feedback for it but i didn't create it and i still don't create it for like those i call those my concept images or the images that i use to kind of process the stuff i don't really mm -hmm. create those for other people mm -hmm. um because it's part of my my therapy. But what happened was what completely surprising. I did decide to share it several months later, just because it kind of looked cool, looks cartoony, totally expecting that, you know, I'll get a lot of negative feedback from it. And at the time I had 30 friends on my social media, all of which I personally knew. <laughs> right. So I thought, okay, well, I can handle that. And when I shared it, that's when I realized that other people will look at that image and attach their own experiences to it mm -hmm. and really, really connect to it. So the exact opposite happened, which made me feel that, you know, I'm not alone in, in having these feelings, which I did feel that I was, something was wrong with me and I was, you know, I was broken in some way. So that's how, mm -hmm. that's how I started creating them. And once I realized the therapeutic uh, advantages of doing that, then I just continued to work through the Rolodex of these, calls and emotions I have in my head and keep producing artwork and being encouraged by my peers, which is great.
the way you described it, you said like um, I trapped them on it, it, on the canvas, right? It's sort of like a cathartic experience for 100%, you. Yeah. Mm. And and then what you're saying is that you got feedback from fellow first responders saying that that speaks to me, or that they there's something about the the painting that does something for me. Can you mm. just comment on yeah, that? Yeah. So they and I didn't really think this was going to happen because the the artwork that I create is very very personal to me. Mm. Like it's really mm. my experience. But as a 20 year paramedic, those experiences really aren't unique to me. You know, the, the emotions I'm having is, but are, right. but it's not many other emergency workers have similar experiences where I'm just lucky that I'm able to portray that complex mm -hmm. idea or that complex emotion into an image, which, you know, really portrays for me how I'm feeling. And other people will look at it and attach their own experiences mm -hmm. and interpret it in their own completely different way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm mm -hmm. lucky that I hear from my peers all around the world every day and they'll share what the artwork that I create means for them. Mm -hmm. And often it's completely different than what my initial, what my motivation was to create yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And that's why when people ask me, you know, what is, what's the motivation behind them? I really don't want to, I have no problem sharing it. And I do talk about that when I do my public speaking, but I don't want to um, devalue other people's interpretation of my artwork. Cause if they see, okay, well, if the artist who created it, this is the motivation behind it. Mm -hmm. That's the authentic reason for creating it. That may devalue their interpretation of it. And yeah. I think all artwork, when people look at it, they'll interpret it in different ways based on their own experiences. So I don't want to rob them of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and often people will look at it and they'll go, Hey, Dan, did you put something here? Did you, cause I hide a lot of things in my artwork yeah. um, to portray that emotion that I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. And, and I'll say, Hey, if you see something there, then it's there. Uh -huh. well, even if I didn't yeah. put something there, I'm not going to tell them it's not there, but they're right. seeing something yeah. uh -huh. because of what their experiences are. So I, I love it that the artwork has done that. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to connect with my peers at that, on that level. And, uh, it really validates me as well of, of what I'm doing and makes mm -hmm. me feel that, you know, the feeling the emotions I'm having, um, you know, it's, it's okay. It's, if other people's are having it, it's, it's all right. What you're saying really resonates with me because when I first learned about you, I went right to your website um, and I bought a few small pieces that you have there, but one of them spoke to me. It, it was like you captured two years of my life in that picture. And it's a picture of an ambulance with a massive female angel with her wings around it. And mm -hmm. I was in charge of my EMS unit for two years during COVID. And every day before I went, I would pray and I would ask the angels to envelop me and watch over myself mm -hmm. and everyone around me. So when I saw that painting, I, I felt like you captured my life in a way that I would not have been able to describe that to people. So yeah, yeah, that uh, that piece really connected with a lot of different people, um, for a lot of different reasons, uh, and I can see why it's not. And I don't want to share the the my motivation sure. behind it because I don't want to change how your interpretation of it. Sure. Uh, but it is definitely of a protective nature. Mm. But before and after, so it's it's a protective mm. nature meant to be you know, before stuff happens, but That's also right. protective nature when th horrible things have happened as well. Right. Is kind of the idea of that. Um, so yeah, that, that a lot of people looked at that and, and really connected with it. And I think based on their own experiences and what, what they've um, dealt with or the experiences that they've had, on the ambulance, that's really been right. a comforting image for them, which makes me feel fantastic. I'm like, wow, that's, I'm so happy I'm able to do that for my peers. It's <laughs> wonderful. Well, speaking of peers and um, more of a collaborative project, you mentioned that you have um, done a project called the COVID Selfie Project. Can you speak a little bit about what that was, how it evolved, and then what it turned mm -hmm. into? Yeah, so that was April, well, I finished it in April, so beginning of, well, a few months before that, in 2020, uh, when COVID started happening, uh, people were sending me selfies of them at work. 
hundreds of them. And I'm like, what, what is happening? Like everyone just kept sending me these pictures <laughs> of them, but cause we all were wearing, you know, all our personal protective equipment. We all had masks, we all had goggles and then some had respirators. Yeah. For some reason, everyone just started sending me these pictures and I, from all around the world. And I realized, Hey, we all look the same. We all are now have this similar uniform, no matter where we are in this environment that we now have to work in. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, I'm going to do a, a big collage of everybody. And I just picked a number like, yeah, I'm going to do a thousand of them. Not knowing that how much time that was going to take me to do. So each picture yeah. that they sent me, I would digitally paint it. And then, then I would put the state uh, or city and country that they're from. And I did a thousand of them. Actually, the original is right behind me on the end of the wall. Oh, that's on yeah. the wall. That's, yeah, I see that. that's the original one. And that's 40 by 60 inches, that picture. Mm -hmm. And there's 62 different countries. It's 1,310 people. There's a dog in there. Someone's holding a little pug. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's really, it took a long time to do, but it really made me feel that, look, this is, we are not alone. We are, we all look the same. And when you get up close to it, you can see their faces. You can see where they're from. Mm -hmm. And we all have a similar look. We all have masks. We all have, mm -hmm. we have eye protection. Some people have, you know, respiratory. We all look the same. So it was like, it gave me a sense of community. Uh, which sometimes we don't get in EMS fire department. We do because we work with larger platoons. Like we work, you know, there's a, there's a crew of people on the mm -hmm. ambulance. It's usually just the two of us. So we don't have that same, but I've, I've seen it because I get to travel. I've seen the community that there is in mm -hmm. EMS and how similar we are all around the world. And that's kind of what inspired me to create that. And you can get that for free. Like I offer that for free. So people, can go on my website they can download a digital copy of that a 40 by 60 inch resolution digital copy of that and print it off and put it in your state in your station and so mm -hmm. i i want other people to to have that sensation of that yeah, you know we're not alone so great stuff yeah it was really rewarding to do a lot of time but really rewarding and we're talking a lot about how your art is healing, you know, after going through the trauma. And once you develop PTSI, would you mind going back a little bit further in the past and just walking us through a little bit of maybe some prevention and things that you've learned that some of our viewers could glean uh, some strength from? Sure. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not a, um, a mental health professional like Stacy. I'm not, not yet. I'm in school for that. But I'll, uh, so I will just share my experiences as a peer of what happened to me and what has worked for me. But I'm not saying this is going to work for everybody, but this is, just, and what I have learned is that everyone has a different flavor on what's going to make them feel better, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm not going to tell people that, look, this is what you should do because it worked for me because it may not. Uh, but for me, I wasn't, my diagnosis came as actually a surprise. So for me, I, I always thought that, post-traumatic stress was, you know, you're normal. And then you have that one event, you have that one call. And then when that one call, you are now impaired because of that one event. But that never happened to me. I had like a long career of many stressors that eventually started uh, manifesting these, these effects that I didn't, wasn't aware that it was from work. Yeah. So I kind of learned by accident, just because our department went and we listened to a psychologist talk about post-traumatic stress, and he was listing off all the signs and symptoms. And mm -hmm. I'm like, holy crap, I really connect with a lot of these. <laughs> and then we went back to the fire hall, and I'm like, right. hey, guys, do you connect with all that stuff? And they're like, no. And I'm like, yeah, no, me neither. I don't know what this guy's <laughs> talking about. <right? laughs> but thinking, I'm like, holy smokes, maybe maybe being suicidal isn't normal, which, you know, when you think about it now, it's really... Mm -hmm. Like it really changed my brain chemistry and really, I wasn't really aware of how much trouble I was in. Right. So because of that presentation, I did call a psychologist and got assessed and was diagnosed. Mm -hmm. uh, and when that happened, then I, my treatment started. And part of that treatment was doing the artwork. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of the symptoms I was having, like difficulty sleeping, really easy to anger, um, mm -hmm. being really isolated, you know, not socializing with people. Uh, caused a lot of a lot of problems in my marriage and at work, mm -hmm. but I never. And then eventually, I really started. I had a suicide plan. But what I was thinking was, you know, I'll end my life and then I'll be okay. 
you know, I didn't realize that the brain chemistry had changed, that I'd lost the capacity of what that actually meant. And mm -hmm. I, the truth is I just didn't want to, I didn't want to die. I didn't want to leave my family. I just didn't want to feel anything anymore. Yeah. Right. And I thought, okay, well, I'm going to put this cozy blanket. I did an art piece called the cozy blanket uh, that, ha that has suicide on it. And mm. I'm going to put this cozy blanket of suicide. I'm going to wrap myself around it and then I'll be okay is what my mindset was. Um, and then when I think about it now, it's like, wow, that's, that's how much my neural pathways had changed that made me think that that was an acceptable, like that was a reasonable solution. Right. And, um, you know, it's scary when I think about it, when I think about it now. So that was probably the most severe symptom. And the, the, what I could do is I could go to work. I could be a good paramedic. I could be mm -hmm. a good firefighter and still have this plan to end my life later in the day on my way home from work right and and i think when we hear of our peers that do die by suicide uh, mm -hmm. and we're often we're so shocked and surprised i think that's why we get we're so good at hiding it from other people mm -hmm. and i call it the false okay i think i've done four or five different art pieces depicting that alone of we show everyone that we're okay we're really good at putting on our i'm okay yeah. suit Mm. Right. But secretly, we're really struggling and people are so shocked and surprised like, oh, I can't believe they killed themselves. You know, how could they do that? We we had no idea. It's because we're so good at at hiding it. But mm. difficulty okay. sleeping, lots of, you know, the common signs and symptoms. Mm. Luckily for me, I did hear that psychologist talk. It made me realize that, hey, I'm in trouble. I need help. Uh, and then I got the help that I needed, and then I recovered. And when I talk, when I present my artwork, uh, and I'm going to exhibit the artwork and speak about my experiences, I really focus on post-traumatic growth, mm -hmm. which is another thing I wasn't aware of. <laughs> well, another yeah. psychologist came up and says, hey, Dan, yeah. you're experiencing post-traumatic growth. I'm like, what did you say to me? What are you talking about? Like, what did you call me? <laughs> what did and, you go, call? and he's like, look it up. And I'm like, wow, it's yeah. it's not a it's a concept that everyone is familiar with, right. but it's it's not because it's in our it's in um, pop culture all the time. If you look at any most superhero origin stories, they're all stories of post traumatic growth where something yeah. tragic happens to them, and because of that tragedy, then you know, great they've become this better, bigger person because of that. Mm -hmm. So for me, if I think of how I was before my trauma and how I am after, I actually feel I'm better. I'm a better person now because of the trauma that happened to me. Mm -hmm. More so, actually more accurate way to say that is because of the trauma and the work that I did to get better. Right. Mm -hmm. The work mm -hmm. I did to, to build new neural pathways in my head and it wasn't easy. But because of that, I'm actually different than I was before I started developing this trauma in the first place. And that's yeah. what post-traumatic growth is. And I, it's a really powerful and um, inspirational message that I want to share with my peers that maybe are really struggling with with what they're going right. through. Saying, like, hey, look, mm -hmm. if, you can, if you can hunker down and, and do the work, um, and, you know, get better, then the rewards could be astounding. You could become better than you were. The message of, you know, being able to uh, emerge from post-traumatic stress injury is a very important one. You know, whether we call it growth, um, you know, just the idea that you do not have to be stuck forever with that diagnosis. If you go and do the work, as you say, um, you, you can eventually get to the point where your symptoms are such that you do not meet the criteria and your life is so much better in so many different areas, interpersonally, at home, your work performance, your sleep, everything. It may take therapy. It may take 
medication. It may take uh, having a creative outlet like you do, Dan. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but giving that message of hope, I think, is critical for first responders, and that you can heal from uh, PTSI. So I and and then uh, I know Bonnie shared her favorite um, images, and and the, this is a segue into my my favorite ones. I was giving a presentation on police suicide because I think that population, given the, you know, the sheer number of suicides versus line of duty deaths for police is, is alarming. Um, and it is an issue with firefighters, uh, 911 dispatchers and EMS as well, but it is profoundly an issue among police. And so there are a couple of paintings that you have done that I can I can just imagine them right now because they really spoke to me. The one of the police officer with his, you know, his mm. hands and the, the sort of like trying to hold himself together. And then there was another painting where he's got a gun next to his head and a phone in the other mm-hmm. hand. Yeah, and, those, and, you know, those ones I did fairly phone. early, yeah. Yeah, that the, and that's a that's a friend of mine. Uh, we worked together. He's an RCMP, a Royal Canadian Mounted Police officer. That we worked at the same station, and I'd asked him to help me with with that. And that picture with his hands over his head, I made it a little bit disproportioned, so his fingers mm-hmm. and hands are actually bigger. And if you look, there's kind of red around it, mm-hmm. uh, and that's called caged demons, meaning that he's trying to keep in. Yeah, his fingers are a cage, and he's trying to keep things contained. Uh, in his head and it's actually even a little bit blurry so that was very intentional uh, for the motivation on that one but I think a lot of people did connect with that Um, and then yeah the one with the phone and the gun Mm -hmm. and he's kind of in the middle it's like which Mm. he's talking to his whatever his support system is yeah it could be his family could be his friend could be whatever that support system is for him Mm -hmm. Uh, and they're trying to talk him out of you know doing what he's planning on doing so yeah it's yeah, I've never been a law enforcement officer. I, I have a lot of friends that are, and I'm, and I do a lot of, um, a lot of reading on reports and stuff for them. I, you know, Dr. Olivia Johnson from the Blue mm. Wall Institute. She does a lot of work for that, and like, she's great. Um, she actually wrote. I asked her to write the forward for my next art book, which should be out in oh, the wow. end of the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, she's she's great. Um, we she's a big supporter of my artwork, and I'm a big supporter of what she does. But she has that fatal ten. I don't know if you're aware. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah we interviewed is, her. We oh, interviewed yeah, right, her. Right. She spoke about that. Yeah, yeah. she's great. She's fantastic. Amazing. So, mm-hmm. and like, and she does a lot, like specific. Uh, right. She's passionate about the law enforcement, and she's has a military background. But yeah, the work that she's doing is really incredible. Well, I like how you're pointing out post traumatic growth because we like to feel on the podcast that we're having guests who are exhibiting that exact thing. They're the living, breathing, breathing examples of who you can be and how much you can change the world after you've been through terrible things or one terrible thing. Um, and so you saying that just validates the work that we do here. Yeah. And I, and I see that all the time. Like I meet my peers that are displaying post-traumatic growth. Most of the time they don't even know they're what's happening right. to them. Yeah, they don't right. I have to remind them. I'm like, Hey, yeah. <laughs> you know, how do you, how do you feel now compared to or before you were a paramedic or a police officer? Oh, she goes, Oh, it's great. The experiences that I've had have really, you know, it's made me a different person. I'm like, well, that's post-traumatic growth. You're, right. you're like, you're like the Hulk that's been exposed to gamma <laughs> radiation. And now you have this super ability because of that trauma you've experienced. Mm. And they're like, oh yeah, that's right. And I, I meet <laughs> people like that, our peers all around the world that are displaying, you know, symptoms of post-traumatic growth. Maybe symptoms isn't a good word, but mm. growth, uh, mm. like they're really, they're different people because of yeah. the therapy that they've gone through so mm-hmm. much that I have my own conference that I do every, well, start was doing it every year where I invite these people to come and talk about their experiences <laughs> of post-traumatic growth. And they're not professional speakers. They're not, <laughs> you know, they're not people that are trying to teach people things. They're like, look, I'm you. This is what happened to me. This is how it really messed me up and potentially even almost killed me. But because of the work that I did, this is what I, this is what's happened to me now. These are the advantages that I've, the benefits of the trauma I experienced and how much greater my life is now because of that. And they share that yeah. as a peer. It's a really powerful, um, it's a really powerful message. 
Hearing a psychologist speak changed the trajectory of your life and your career and um, and had such profound effect uh, ramifications down the line. And can you share with us a little bit about what your next chapter is going to be um, as you kind of shift gears out of paramedic mode? Yeah, so I'm officially going to be retired, I think, next month is when I'll be officially no longer with the fire department. Mm -hmm. And in its time, I'm I'm ready. It wasn't my plan. So my, I had another relapse of the symptoms that I recognized that came up a couple of, about a year, just over a year ago, mm. uh, where it really started to affect my memory, uh, but I understood what was happening. Because although I was diagnosed and had treatment, I was still being exposed to trauma. Sure. And that was started to affect me. And after, you know, 20 years, my psychologist said, hey, Dan, you're done. Like you're no longer, you're not going to be able to do your mm. retire at 65 in the emergency services because you... You can't do it. And I'm like, and I was, you know, I was okay with it. I'm like, yeah, you know what? I think my bucket is full. I've, I've experienced uh, mm -hmm. what I've had to experience. Uh, I was hoping to, to stay on for, for another 15 years, but, uh, or 10 years, but, that, but that's okay. Uh, that's, that's okay. And now I'm back to school. I'm learning to become a counseling therapist. <laughs> uh, I have another year yeah. and a half of school to do that. And then when I'm done, I want to counsel my peers and, focus on spousal support mm -hmm. and substance abuse and addiction and trauma and grief and, and then build workshops, continue doing what I'm doing, traveling and exhibiting my artwork mm -hmm. and talking about my own experiences, but also doing, you know, workshops on those, on those topics, you know, either half day, full day or three day workshops is really what, uh, what my next chapter is, is going to be, I think. And I'm really excited about it. And I love learning about this stuff like dr raymond this stuff is i'm so fascinated i'm so fascinated when i because i think as i learn it i'm i'm analyzing myself i'm like oh that's what happened to me oh that's what's going that was going on and make it makes sense mm -hmm. and i'm as passionate about learning these these things as i was when i was learning to become a paramedic and firefighter like it's mm -hmm. i've learned mm -hmm. i'm reading extra books because i'm i'm so interested in it uh, and i'm really passionate that i know that i'm going to be able to uh to help other people just in a, in a different way. So it's, uh, it's very exciting, very, very exciting. Well, and it struck me when you said that um, you're gonna be able to help so many more people by doing what you're doing and becoming a therapist, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think the proof is being able to move on and although it's shorter than you wanted to, um, I think of it as really a macro scale now. You know, you take yeah. all that experience and you tuck it in your belt and you use it to help every single person you come across in the future. Mm -hmm. And I'll, and I'll still continue creating the artwork. I'll still, right. I'll still continue to do that. And, you know, it's wonderful that my artwork does help people already, uh, but mm -hmm. it's going to be great to continue doing that and then help them from an, from an educated therapist right. background as well. Right. So I'm really excited about that. It's going to be great. Well, welcome to the club and you're hired, just so you know. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. We've I'm really excited. We've interviewed several first responders <laughs> who their next step, their next chapter is to go on to become a therapist and yeah. to specifically help other first responders. And so, you know, what, what a you can't really come up with a better type of therapist than somebody who's uh, walk the walk, talk the talk of being a first responder. You know, they've yeah. been there, done that, you know? Yeah. I think that's great. And I think we need more people like that because mm -hmm. I often hear from my yeah. peers that, you know, that their therapist just doesn't understand and they don't, that's right. They don't really get what they're doing. Right. And, uh, right. Even, even, you know, a lot of the schooling that I'm taking, I can recognize that gap there that, mm -hmm. um, the, some of the things that they're saying, look, look, this really, this approach really wouldn't, you know, if you say this to right. an emergency worker, this is how they're going to like, they're the identity that they have, or we have mm -hmm. what we do 
-hmm. you know, even though we would prefer in many cases to stay in a profession that will kill us rather than contemplate the idea of, okay, well, maybe I should leave and become a basket weaver so that I don't die by suicide. Like that yeah. isn't, we'd rather stay in a profession to the point where we're going to die by suicide rather than we attach that. That's our identity so entrenched that to suggest otherwise is offensive in many cases. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it has to be really delicate, right? It has to be a delicate mm -hmm. um, way of approaching that. But a lot of people get really quite angry on when I, when I post an image and a lot of comments come in and they share their experiences or what that image meant, other people might come in and say, well, why don't you just quit? I have to delete some of those comments because it gets so, yeah. it gets so mm -hmm. angry. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, people are so uh, mm -hmm. attached to what they do as their identity right. and they're so passionate about it. Anyways, I don't know how I went on that rant, but I don't know how this <laughs> conversation even started. But Well, the unfortunate thing, you're right. There is a shortage of us. There aren't enough of us therapists who understand first responder culture, um, what it's like to walk in their shoes and how they have to pick up the pieces from that. Um, and so we commend you. We commend all others. who, And we have a bunch that we're trying to um, encourage behind the scenes, shall we say, uh, to do the same work. <laughs> Because there just aren't enough of us, and we talk about it all the time. We try to help first responders when we go into agencies and departments to understand how vital it is for them to have someone who really can listen to their material and handle it. Yeah, and not you know the psychologist that I had, uh, he wasn't an emergency worker, but he specialized in it and had right. That's what he does. That's so right. he spoke yeah. the language, right? So even though I don't right. want to say that. You know, unless you've had the experience, you're not mm -hmm. like, that's yeah. not my message. My message is, mm -hmm. you know, if you can't find someone who has that experience, find someone that has experience treating or counseling emergency workers. So they already kind of know, uh, right. you know, the lingo and the know the language and stuff. And, and that's, you know, that's great too. And there's a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of therapists out there like that as well that specialize mm -hmm. in treating emergency workers, which is great. Mm -hmm. I noticed in a lot of your, paintings that there would be the spirit of the deceased mm -hmm. what looks to be the, the spirit of the deceased um can you comment on the you know the reason or rationale for putting that because now I'll, I'll i'll preface um well I'll, I'll say first that what i have found and what when um other uh first responders especially emts that have lost emts or paramedics that have lost a patient that, that, that the fact that the spirit may go on kind of gives them some hope or inspiration and in that it's not just that they failed, um, you know, on some level, it kind of, it's like, okay, they're moving on to another realm perhaps. So with saying that, what are your thoughts about why the spirit of the patient is there? That's a great question. And no one's ever asked me that before. And I'm happy to answer it. Oh, but it's good. different. It's different for every picture because I, mm -hmm. when I create the artwork, I'm trying to portray the, or an I, emotion or I'm trying to illustrate the emotion I'm having. Mm -hmm. And I often use the spirits to mm -hmm. do that. But it depends on what the circumstance or what I'm trying to portray. So one example um, is the Christmas nightmare picture that I did. Right. So there, and it's based on an actual call. Uh, was fairly early on in my career and the image is we're all working and paramedics were working on a patient they're defibrillating him there's a christmas tree and then the family is watching the mother's mm -hmm. shielding the eyes of her kids and the spirit is there hugging his wife mm. uh, and the reason i created that is that patient was conscious breathing and talking when we came into the room Mm. And as I was about to intubate him between defibrillations, I looked up and saw the family and they were just horrified. Mm. They didn't, you know, for people that haven't seen people get defibrillated, it's pretty, well, shocking. Yeah. Right? It's you know, there's body jumps, it there's is. electricity and it's pretty violent. Yeah. And when mm. I look up at this family, I thought, oh man, what am I doing? Like I, mm -hmm. I'm a, mm. like this family's has, they don't know, no one's telling them what to do. No one, no one's telling them, explaining to them what's happening. Uh, and as far as they know, their husband, like their family and their husband and their dad was talking. We came in, 
And, you know, now we're doing all these incredible invasive things to them and they don't really understand what's happening. And that's what really stuck with me. Uh, the patient ended up dying, but it was what really struck me is that this, what that family witnessed, because we just get our blinders on, like, okay, this is what we're doing. Okay, this yeah. is what we see, this is what we do. Okay, this is what we see, this is what we do, right? We're just so focused on what we're doing. And, you know, we do it all the time. It's no big, well, I don't want to say it's no big deal, but it's not, you know, for this family, they're, it's the biggest event of their life. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned from that is if I have the resources or if I can, if I'm running the call, I will actually stay with the family um, and assign another mm -hmm. paramedic there. Yep. to run the call or assign if I have victim services come to sign someone with the family to explain to them what is happening because that will affect the rest of their life of their memory of that experience yeah. mm -hmm. and that really stuck with me of of I felt what I was doing to that family by not paying attention to them mm -hmm. and that's why the spirit is there so the spirit is there comforting the family mm -hmm. because I wasn't doing it for them or nobody was doing it for them mm -hmm. so that's why he was there uh, there's another picture that I did uh, called Behind the Scenes, which is one of my favorite and the originals on the back wall there, where there's two paramedics there working on a, a young man who was stabbed. And on the left-hand side, the Grim Reaper is there. He's yeah. kind of ghosted in there. And the top middle, the spirit of the patient is there and he's screaming because he can see what's happening. He can see his body. He can see the Grim Reaper. Mm -hmm. And then in the reflection... On the other side is an angel with her hand on the shoulder of the paramedic that's about to uh, intubate. Mm -hmm. And that's called behind the scenes. And meanwhile, the mm -hmm. two paramedics, you know, we're just doing our thing, following our protocols. We're like, yeah, this is a traumatic. This guy needs a surgeon. Mm -hmm. but we're going to try to plug the holes and fill the container before we buy him some time before we get to the, to the surgery. I've delivered lots of babies in the back of the ambulance. So I've people have died in the back of the ambulance, and I can feel this energy change happen when that when yeah. that happens. Mm -hmm. And that's why I created that art piece mm -hmm. is behind the scenes mm -hmm. that I don't like. I I know, and I think if you talk to most paramedics, like there's stuff that we just don't know. Like we've mm -hmm. seen, and I did a post about it and asked people to share things. Well, you know, what do you what do you guys think? And God, the the comments on there were not surprising to me, but surprising at how many other paramedics have similar experiences of things mm -hmm. that happen that they can't really explain while people are, are dying in their presence. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, you know, the, the spirit is, this is a traumatic death for this patient mm -hmm. and he recognizes it's a shocking event for him. Mm -hmm. So we can see the Grim Reaper, he can see the angel, he can see himself. Mm -hmm. So he is upset. So he's screaming in that picture, but it's not mm -hmm. always that way. Mm -hmm. You know, in other pictures I've done, the spirit's angry at me for not saving them because mm -hmm. of what I've done to the family. And so for me, mm -hmm. a lot of the things that stuck with me isn't so much the patient, it's the periphery, it's their family mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. or the witnesses. That's the stuff that really kind of sticks with me. Because when mm -hmm. people are unconscious and they're, yeah. and they're dying they're dead, they're not, I don't want to say they're not suffering, but if they're unconscious, they're not. I'll just say it. Hmm. Now, people have, well, I've seen people die horribly as well. However, you know, when they're unconscious, it's the people that witness that that are going to sure. really, um, right. and those are the things mm -hmm. that, that really stick with me is give, doing death notifications and, mm -hmm. and how the families are going to respond to what it is. So that's mm -hmm. kind of the motivation of why I put a lot of the spirits yeah. in there. Yeah. Oh, that's an incredible um, answer. And, um, I think that you speak to you know what many responders uh, experience, especially on the EMS uh, yeah. critical incident where we just hyper focus on the patient and mm -hmm. really lose sight of the fact that there's other people in the room who are being affected in that moment by 
our actions and, and the emergency itself. And the fact that you're able to kind of, uh, you know, put this into a into an image and um, and preserve sure. that um, and to share it is is quite astounding. And um, and I think every responder has got a career full of those images because we're not typically recording them. We're not shooting video. We're not taking pictures mm. uh, unless we're a, a law enforcement officer with a right. with a camera. But those are all like part of our, you know, the continual uh, flow of calls that make up a career, and uh, you've kind of immortalized them. So it's uh, it's really yeah. incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really a complex. You know, when I think of the emotion of of that, like that Christmas nightmare one, like so much was happening, and when I that call really haunted me for a long time, mm. in a very complex way, like it wasn't. Like mm -hmm. the emotions that would come in, I describe it as like an uh, an organic monster that invades my consciousness uninvited. Like yeah. it just things will pop in, and it's not necessarily images. It's you know smells. It's mm -hmm. emotion. It's um, you know mm -hmm. it's not a flashback. It's not that concrete. It's not. Right. It's not that. Um, so it was very complex. It was very complicated. Mm -hmm. So when I was able to create that, it wasn't like that in my head right. anymore. It wasn't right. because I simplified it into that image for myself. So when I look at it, I'm like, okay, this is, I put it into this box mm -hmm. and it was, and it no longer, yeah, you know, then it no longer mm -hmm. invaded my consciousness uninvited right. after yeah, I created it because yep. I purged it. I purged well, it yeah. Out. You processed it through the art and yes. You know what I think too, you touched a topic that I've never heard anyone else capture. Um, and I often think about that war that you feel as a paramedic or an EMT when you know your patient's slipping away and you know that they're going to another place and you're trying everything earthly, humanly possible. Um, and it does feel like a war. It feels like you're battling something, another power, you know, yeah. and, um, and the way you describe yeah. that is just, um, I've never heard anyone be able to capture it in words. And you know, Bonnie, that's how I, that's how I felt earlier on in my career. Right. But probably the last five years of my career, I've realized that death is not the worst thing that can happen to people. Mm -hmm. Again, mm -hmm. this is my own opinion, right. <laughs> but this is as a 20 year medic. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I, and I'm not, I don't think I'm unique in feeling this way, but sometimes death comes as a massive comfort for people mm -hmm. right or mm -hmm. people are asking yes. for it yes they're like you know release me from this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to be there at that moment yeah you know if you have the capacity to be compassionate and not have the blinders on which we mm -hmm. so often we do we're like yeah. okay we need to save this person here's our protocols we've got to do this that versus right okay let's just be present for this person right. while they're passing like yeah. that mm -hmm. is a, an incredible um opportunity to be present with somebody mm -hmm. like of course we're going to do our protocol of course we're yeah, going to try to save sure. them right yeah. and it's very difficult to do both right i think but my my opinion of what death meant really kind of shifted mm -hmm. later on in my career um as and i got in trouble for this for a couple of times where i'd put the grim reaper often in the in my artwork and people are like, why would you put something so evil as the Grim Reaper in your artwork? I'm like, well, first of all, I don't think the Grim Reaper is evil at all. I don't think they're evil. They're they're they have their job to do, and they're doing what they have to do. Uh, and often they're coming as a as a great comfort to people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm going to try to prevent him from getting his way, but I don't see I I see him more as a coworker versus someone that I'm trying to fight against mm -hmm. you know and a lot of the artwork i started changing how i portray the grim reaper most mm -hmm. pictures you see the grim reaper is like this evil mean looking person right. or, yep. or this thing you know yeah. the skull that looks angry yeah or you know screaming i'm like so now what i try to do in my newer art pieces is make the grim reaper more compassionate looking mm -hmm. than more evil looking mm -hmm. again this is my own experiences that yeah. i've had with right. death and um and I think the the weird, which is another reason why I kind of realized that maybe it was time for me to get out was, you know, I, I thought that that was, those kind of calls were just normal. You know, I started having the idea of, 
okay, well, tomorrow at work, someone's going to die. And that's just, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't a, um, an eventful thing for me. It would be, I started to normalize the tragedies mm -hmm. of other people mm -hmm. yeah. as in, okay, well that, this is just what life is like. This is just a normal, like I, it, my heart rate wouldn't go up. I would go to calls where, you know, I wouldn't get amped up at all anymore. And I thought, Oh man, what's I'm like, am I getting that numb? Mm -hmm. um, and is it that normalizing for me that I'd go in there? I'm like, Oh, this isn't that bad. I even said that once to somebody. Mm -hmm. And of course they freaked out on me. Cause it was pretty, a uh, pretty violent event that happened. I'm like, Oh, this is, you're going to be fine because the call we did before was way worse. But to them, of course, it's the most horrific event that's ever happened in their life. Mm. And I went in there and just totally minimized it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what I started to, ha started to happen for me. Mm -hmm. And that's another reason I'm like, yeah, I think maybe I've, I've done my, my, my time. Bonnie, I want to go come back to a question that you asked me earlier on that I didn't mm -hmm. finish. Sure. You would ask me, uh some of the symptoms but also what i do apart from my artwork to get better yeah so i want to i want to talk a little bit about that, that. would be great because right, i want to talk about the yeah this stuff happens and this is what affects us but you know this is what you know i did to get so the artwork was one of them uh the other part was making the decision that i needed help so i made that decision mm -hmm. that okay i can't do this on my own i need to get help uh i've always thought that the next day i would you know, tomorrow will be better. Tomorrow will be better. And I had to make that realization that, okay, well, it's like, I have a busted leg. I can't walk off a busted leg. I need help, professional yeah. help to, to get better. So that was a difficult decision for me to make. Hmm. Um, I did, um, I have a perspective was a big deal for me and how I saw myself. And so I have a Daniel 2.0 version of myself <laughs> and I always strive to be that guy. Right. Mm. So if I'm in a situation, I'm like, okay, well, what would a better version of me do? Mm. And then I just do that. And that mm. is really easy. And then eventually you become that guy. <laughs> but there's two sides to that, right? So if I wake up in the morning and I look at myself in the mirror and think, yeah, you are a horrible person or you're just a mess, then I become that person. Right. And it happens really quick. And often that's what I was for the longest time, you know, in the depth of my trauma. Mm. I was, you know, I was getting, you know, sad, super depressed, very angry. And that was just accepting like that's who I am or, you know, I am my trauma and that's what I became. So the idea of, of striving to be a better version mm -hmm. and being that was a really powerful thing for me. Uh, and that, that worked, worked really, really mm -hmm. well for, and I continue to, to try to be that way. Uh, I do, I go for a walk every day. So I think of, of habits, you know, not all habits are bad. So I started to listen to audiobooks mm -hmm. while I go for walks. Mm -hmm. So some days I'm like, okay, well, I don't really want to go for a walk, but I really want to listen to that book. <laughs> I'm, I'm really at an interesting part. Right. So I'll go. And now I'm at the point where if I listen to an audiobook at home, it's just weird. <laughs> um, and then sometimes I'll, I won't want to, I'm at a, maybe not read listening to a good book, but I really want to go for my walk. So that's really been something that's really turned into like a normal thing for me where now I'm doing like five, 10 K walks every day. Mm, wow. And it's, uh, you know, so that was a habitual thing that I started that really kind of turned into something, um, uh, pretty, uh, pretty great for me. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I continue to do. Uh, I, you know, I play guitar as well. So I try to do something with the creative part of my brain. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not very good at it, so no one asked me to come on their podcast <laughs> to play the guitar because I'm not great at it. But I, it's still really therapeutic for me. So I found something to do for that. Um, yeah, I try to cultivate new relationships. Um, you know, I'd be vul I'm I'm vulnerable in my artwork and in other parts of my life, uh, and that's sometimes tricky. But I, I I need to be honest with myself. the The other thing I I do is, and I found this really interesting because I was trying to. Um, kind of adopted it myself about having this sense of integrity mm -hmm. and um, and being honorable to myself in my relationships with other people. So I started doing a little bit of research on that, and and it wasn't for the benefit of others; it was more of the benefit of myself. But uh, in the 14 to 1600s in Japan, samurai warriors followed the bushido code, mm -hmm. um, and I read this book about that. And it's this code that, you know, a lot of there's, I think there's, depending on which, where you read it, seven or eight virtues. And they followed this code because their lives were so violent. Mm. They followed this code of, uh, you know, integrity, honor, respect. 
uh, to balance out their their tragic or their life of trauma mm -hmm. and they use that as a balance you know and it was you know some of it gets pretty extreme i don't really know if it's some of those guys were pretty hardcore but a lot of the values and virtues that they have i think are things that i tried to follow mm -hmm. And I, and it does work for me. It's, it balances out, gives me purpose, gives me focus. And, um, it gives me like a code to, to kind of guide myself mm -hmm. with. So those are some of the, and then dogs, okay. of course, dogs are a big, big part of my, um, my therapy. They don't have to be a therapy dog. They just have to be a dog. <laughs> and that's therapeutic mm -hmm. enough for mm -hmm. me. Well, well, we yeah, were hoping for a, uh, we we're hoping for a guest appearance by Dexter. But, uh, yeah, I can hear him upstairs. He's up there snoring. He snores so loud that I can actually hear him, which is okay. I'm like, okay, he's not, uh, he's not chewing my furniture. So that's okay. That's but, excellent. Uh, well, I, I appreciate you going back to those because I think the more that we can educate our listeners and viewers to the fact that it takes many things to get better. There's no one thing that's going to help you. And even when Stacy and I are doing EMDR with clients, we encourage them to find other ways to self-care and to nourish themselves. And so I, I really, really appreciate those examples you've given and the setting intentions is so important. So thank you, Daniel. Yeah. And it's, it, it's different for everybody. You know, what I've, what I've yeah. seen, like the politics in mental health support is really mind blowing, but yeah, everybody, mm. you know, if you go to a coffee shop and are told that, you know, you need to have a, um, you know, a, latte and oat latte and if you don't well you're an idiot right well right. then it's like well what if i don't like oat lattes like what if i what if i want to have a macchiato maybe if that's what i want then i say okay well, that's what you want if that's going to make you feel better then that's what you should get versus a lot of places i've seen it's like well these are the treatments that we endorse and if you don't follow our eap program then we are not going to support you in any way if you don't follow what we offer you um which is which is kind of like okay that th this is the only option you get to get better but it's so different for everybody and the big challenge i think is to discover what is it that makes you feel better sometimes mm -hmm. that's a big hurdle to get over mm -hmm. right it's not as simple as a busted leg where there's only yeah. <clears throat> right. you know a few different ways of, to to fix that so yeah it's it's helping people find out what that therapeutic model is going to be for them that's going to make them feel better well, Daniel, as we wrap up, um, where can people find you out there on the internet, social media, website, all that good stuff? Yeah, so my uh, my artist name is Dan Sun. So it's the first three letters of my first and last name. So it's D-A-N-S-U-N. -S my website's dansunphotos.com. Mm -hmm. uh, and even if you just Google D-A-N-S-U-N, -S all my social media stuff will pop up there. And I'm on Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and Twitter, and you'll see me all there. This has been an incredible conversation, uh, ranging far and wide, and into some great, great topics and and uh, subjects that we so appreciate you being there to s share with us. And uh, it was just great spending this time with you today. Great. Well, thanks, David. I can't believe it's been an hour already. Yeah. I feel like I'm just getting. I feel like I'm just getting started. Like let's, let's talk about the next topic. Yeah. It's, right. so I really, I genuinely appreciate you having me on your show. Thank, thank you so much. Please like and subscribe, go to YouTube, we're on Responder Resilience, Facebook, Responder Wellness Inc., and Responder TV, bbsradio.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and our website is Responder TV with past episodes and guest info. Till the next time, stay safe, be kind to yourself, take care.